I'm uh, really happy to introduce our first uh, speaker, Scotch McClure from uh, Maxwell. Uh, they're sponsoring, so extremely grateful for your support and thank you so much for coming. And please, uh, whenever you're ready, go ahead. All right, uh, thank you so much. I wanna start with the gratitude. Uh, there, we've, uh, we've really built this on the backs of so many of your work. Uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll have specific thanks as we're moving through the presentation here. Um, I'm gonna try and keep it on time and maybe a little bit early so that uh, you can have uh, questions answered. Um, feel free to download the slides. Um, this will take you right to the slide deck that I'm uh, using that uh, QR code will pop up uh, several times in the, uh, in the presentation. Uh, obviously, I have a conflict of interest. I'm CEO of Maxwell Biosciences, and we're taking this into human trials to commercialize it. Uh, we're backed by a long list of pedigreed uh, investors, and um, looking forward to talk with you more about it. If you're interested in investing, we are raising money. I want to start with, again, grat gratitude for uh, and acknowledgments here. A lot of work with Stanford, uh, with NYU, the Department of Defense. Uh, DARPA initially funded this as uh, a synthetic immune system about 15 years ago. Uh, U.S. Department of Energy continues uh, to support the project and has for over a decade. Uh, and the NIH uh, continues to perform uh, many of the experiments that you're going to hear about today. All of the experiments here have been done by these independent researchers. Our company does not have uh, our own labs, so we just send the compound out to these researchers. So what we have here is scientific consensus that this technology works in animals and in the labs. That's important because I'm about to blow your mind. Most of you are going to say this is going to be too good to be true. So. Uh, it started way back in 2015. I saw Tony Weiss Carre is here. I met with him and Carol Lee, uh, CEO of Alcahest, even before there was a name for it, before uh, Alcahest was named, thinking about working together. I worked with the Convoys and several others to, uh, to, to get data into this system. So um, if for, for those of you who are not familiar with heterochronic parabiasis, it's when an old and young mouse are connected together so that only the microcapillaries of the skin are able to exchange blood between the two. So uh, the biology at first looks like this. So you see sort of weak antimicrobial responses, high inflammation, weak apoptosis, uh, weak skin and epithelial, uh, tissues, low stem cell recruitment, and low angiogenesis in the old mouse, as, as we uh, have all you know, seen in studies, and the opposite in the young mouse, right? So then the old mouse gets younger, we all know that, and so it, it has nearly identical uh, aspects to the younger mouse. So this is what brought me out of commercial real estate AI into uh, this field, and so I started applying uh, my skills to figure out how this is happening, because it's so fascinating to me. So for about two years, uh, I took uh, a lot of money out of, uh, of uh, my portfolio and, uh, and put it into funding this, brought in scientists and uh, software engineers and interns and, uh, and, and processed it through a, a big data analysis from mouse data as well as human data. Uh, and did a lot of analysis on blood plasma, uh, and, uh, and what we came up with was LL37, which is a, a rapidly disappearing peptide. It uh, disappears in about six minutes in the bloodstream. It's also known as human catholicidin antimicrobial peptide and ex expressed by the human camp gene for the geneticists in the room. So uh, we also uh, studied at the Buck Institute. So I studied with uh, Dr. Uh, Bredesen there on a, something called the MEND dementia therapy, which is a, a diet and lifestyle change um, that was characterized mostly by supplementation. So you see phenylbutyrate right here, bexarotin, DHA, curcumin, res resveratrol, balanced D3, NAD, uh, and, uh, and what we saw was that this, the studies, and you can download these slides again, there'll be another QR code. Each of these are links, so you can really drill into this here. We also saw 37 was a key component of that therapy. 
metformin also upregulates LL37. So more confirmation there. More links to when you uh, I really recommend downloading the slides and drilling into this. Um, more data here. I'm not going to go into it, but uh, there's the QR code again. If you uh, if you want to research more about LL37 in morbidity and mortality and aging, uh, really interesting conversation with ChatGBT on this. Uh, went into immunosenescence and uh, an understanding more about uh, the immune system and the dysregulation and reduction in production of neutrophils. Neutrophils are the key producer of LL37. Uh, and, uh, and so this is essentially the summary. LL37 is involved in stem cell recruitment, apoptosis, cytokine management, wound healing, angiogenesis, and antimicrobial or antisepsis at these various different concentrations in the blood serum. Now, again, it disappears really rapidly, and so you're not going to see it in broad spectrum analysis. You're going to have to sample and immediately uh, test, but it disappears like within six minutes. So LL37 regulates systemic healing processes. It's, uh, it, uh, it's not just directly uh, affecting things. It's also in stem cell recruitment and chemotaxi for the entire immune system. So it's essentially cleaning, soothing, healing, and protecting tissues. This is, sounds sort of like what disappears as you age, right? Uh, so, uh, again, familiar with the young mouse, right? It's a, this, uh, this appears logically to fit with, uh, with the heterochronic parabiasis uh, outcomes. Uh, we see that LL37 is upregulated by sunlight, vitamin D production, uh, good nutrition, and exercise. Little interesting side note is that vitamin D prevents RAD51 loss in progeria cells. Um, so, progeria is not a good model for aging, but just a little interesting side note. Uh, so LL37 is part of the healthy healing uh, secretum, right? So it's produced in all organs. It's uh, very well studied in the brain, the heart, epithelial, macrophages, apoptosis of aging cells. Uh, absolutely required in apoptosis of aging cells, by the way. You cannot have apoptosis without LL37. And, uh, and essentially pathogens uh, mimic the apoptotic uh, process in order to infect cells, which is really interesting. So uh, it's a possible super drug, but again, LL37 breaks down quickly and unpredictably in vivo. So um, even in one person, right, and, uh, LL37 would, would break down uh, faster, for instance, during the day than at night. So it's completely unpredictable in human trials. So how to solve this problem? So um, the effective uh, side chains, the functional side chains in LL37 are attached at the carbon, and that's where the proteolytic degradation happens. And so uh, we had the idea to essentially mess with that bond there and see if we could sort of hide that bond from the, uh, from the enzymes. And we were successful with that with the help of the Department of Energy, NIH, and Northwestern University. So the nitrogen bond here is substituted for the carbon bond. It's a little bit more complex than that, but uh, essentially the sta stability problem now is solved. And we have a non-peptide that folds and acts, including chiral properties in, in other regards, as a peptide. This is the first time in human history. It's a massive breakthrough. We have a small molecule that can act like a peptide to fold like a, a protein. So we have a working mimic of LL37, a potential synthetic immune system. Uh, now what do we do with it? So uh, there at the bottom, you can see roughly to scale what uh, we've branded clarimers, uh, these, this family of uh, small molecules that mimic LL37 or the cathelicide and antimicrobial peptides of the body. So let's, uh, in our discussion internally within the company, what do we do? So aging clearly will not be regulated as a disease. So it can't go directly after aging. So biological dysregulation is the aging disease, right? So maybe we should just call it biological dysregulation. So uh, that happens through hormone depletion, thymus involution, trauma, damage, and general dysregulation. Uh, the disease then uh, causes immune depletion, inflammation, and uh, DNA damage. So we're very familiar with immunosenescence and inflammation. I'm not going to go uh, into that too much, but that's essentially what we're targeting here. And, uh, and so we can kind of just sort of guess at which aspects LL37 is involved in the 12 hallmarks of aging. So pretty much all of them. Uh, so. Infections accelerate aging. This is very well shown. There's thousands of 
of studies on LL37 and the various different effects of uh, dysregulation of LL37. Uh, we, see, uh, we see examples of immune dysregulation dysreg and the effect of not having enough LL37, especially in uh, acquired immunodeficiency syndrome or AIDS. Um, we see high levels of heart and kidney disease, frailty and cognitive impairment, uh, similar to aging in, in AIDS. And then also 70% of the people in the room, if you look around, seven out of 10 of you have an HSV-1 infection of the brain right now. Uh, and then that um, presents a, a clinically uh, as cognitive impairment, loss of memory, et cetera, later in life. So uh, also uh, pathogen driver of aging here or the diseases of aging or uh, biological dysregulation as we like to call it is H. pylori. So it dr drives stomach cancer, colorectal cancer and cardiovascular disease. And um, about 50% of people have H. pylori infections. Um, it's larger in the third world, about two, -third, th two thirds of the total world. Uh, population. Now, why should you uh, potentially think about going after infectious disease uh, when you're going after uh, aging indications? Well, the FDA is much more likely to approve it. So, uh, in fact, about four to five times higher uh, rate of approval. Uh, the Congressional Gain Act in the United States gives you a 12-year exclusive uh, commercialization window as opposed to the traditional seven, and you have a high rate of FDA breakthrough therapy designations. So uh, infectious disease today is generally caused by viruses, bacteria, and fungi. This is a big problem and causes sickness and death for millions. We saw too much of this during COVID. The doctor says there's nothing we can do and we need to stop that, right? So it's not just aging, it's also the age of pandemics that we're entering into that's very important. So the drug that we're taking to the market at, uh, going into human trials next year is called MXB22510. It's effective against all tested bacteria. Uh, even antibiotic resistant bacteria, it doesn't matter because this is a mimic of the immune system. It's effective against all tested fungus. Um, it is not effective against all tested viruses. We have other, uh, other molecules that are effective more broadly, including Ebola and others. But what's interesting here is it's effective against all tested herpes viruses, including acyclovir resistant herpes, uh, HHV4 and others not on here as well, and has no effect on the gut microbiome. So very interesting data there. Um, these other compounds have effects against Ebola, um, pan herpes, pan hepatitis, pan influenza. Uh, you can see you know, parts per billion concentration potency against the various different versions of the coronavirus there. So uh, we're actually traveling around the world right now in Asia and, and all over. We're talking with um, the House Appropriations Committee uh, defense uh, to create biodefense uh, assets uh, going into this war that we're probably headed into. So the NIH uh, funded animal studies in serine hamsters. It showed that it was uh, totally prophylactic and totally therapeutic uh, for the COVID-19 disease state as a, a very active immune system is. And it's effective against completely suppressing uh, an Ebola uh, infection. So uh, even at lower uh, concentrations. So uh, we found that to be really interesting. That's a potential $3 billion uh, indication right there just because the federal government will pay for that. Again, these, what was done by the Rocky Mountain Lab by the NIH. We, do, we don't do these studies ourselves. Obviously, we can't get a copy of the Ebola virus. So um, what would it require to replace the bulk of antibiotics in humans and livestock? One, you'd have to have a new mechanism of action like what we're talking about here. It would have to be effective against all tested bacteria, safe and non-toxic in animal trials and human tissues, massively scalable, and less expensive to manufacture by one half. And then, of course, gravy on top here is that our compounds uh, require no cold chain, no refrigeration. It's completely shelf stable. In fact, we cooked it on a hot plate for 30 days, same exact properties to the chemical afterwards because of that robust small molecule nature, not what you would see in a peptide at all. So uh, we also see no development of bacterial resistance. Um, we're going deeper into this. Uh, the University of Louisville is, uh, is funding this and performing uh, the studies, but you can see even after a large number of passages, we're still not able to produce any resistance in Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and there's other data on this as well. 
So this is in comparison to the top 10 antibiotics in existence today. We've all had, you know, doxycycline, amoxicillin, vancomycin, et cetera. So uh, what we show is that MXP22510 has broad spectrum efficacy and then also is, uh, is extremely safe. In fact, we don't see any toxicity or even up to 3,000 times the effective concentration. I told you it's going to be sounded too good to be true, but you got to dig into the data here. Uh, so we're going to the FDA with a nasal spray to counter exactly the way the pathogens get into the sinus cavity and into the brain. Uh, so these, uh, these sinus infections result in 28,000 deaths per year uh, due to the infection getting into the brain, and then the inflammation causes function loss, depression, anxiety, memory loss, personality change, and of course that 28,000 uh, numbers of death just in the United States. So uh, the nasal spray uh, device is going to be a smart device, a Bluetooth uh, device that is connected to your phone. On your phone will be an AI agent that asks you how you're feeling and will be co collecting data on the depression, anxiety, et cetera. We're going to the, uh, the FDA just for chronic sinusitis, which is a 100% antibiotic resistant indication right now. And, uh, and then, of course, I think we're, we'll get the breakthrough designation uh, because it's an unmet medical need. So we're hoping to restore not just sinus function, but also uh, brain function, memory, and personality. Uh, we are raising money. I'm not going to focus too much on that right now. Um, you can download the slides right there, and I'm open to any questions. Thank you so much. That was really a great talk. Uh, we have time for one question. Oh, yeah, sorry. Sorry, Luigi. How could I miss you? Is it detectable in the blood, or do you have an antibody that can be used to detect it? So we don't, uh, we're not focused on any antibodies or any function of the adaptive immune system. Although LL37 is produced by all of the T cells, all the white blood cells of the body, we're just trying to focus on the anti-inflammatory side of the immune function, right? So innate immune function and MXB22510, this compound that we're going into human trials with, uh, it shows only anti-inflammatory neutrophil activity. So it actually converts uh, inflammatory cytokine production by neutrophils and, and causes the, the, uh, the neutrophils to start producing anti-inflammatory cytokines. All right. Thank you so much, Scotch. And thanks again for your amazing support. Really appreciate it.